Hey, everybody, it's Ron Johnson, and this is the Ron Johnson Show, Locked On Sports Minnesota. The Vikings, we asked that question last week, five and three or six or two? You got the answer. We'll talk about that. Also, the Gophers, six wins as well. They're bowling. We got to break that down. But did anybody expect the Gophers and the Vikings to be at six wins at this point in the season? We'll just talk about that and much more coming up next on the Ron Johnson Show. Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. And it starts now. Hey, everybody, it's Ron Johnson, and it's a beautiful Tuesday. You know why? Because there's no snow. The Vikings have six wins. The Gophers have six wins. That's a beautiful Tuesday to me, Sam. And uh, when, when you think about this, people, everybody understands what's going on in sports right now in Minnesota. It's all about the quarterback. You got Max Brosmer with the Gophers. You got Sam Darnold with the Vikings. We're going to break down each of these guys. Also, where do they land? Where are the Gophers in the Big Ten? And where are the Vikings? in the nfc because the super bowl matters and we still have an undefeated team out there for those that stayed up late to watch the overtime game with the chiefs again we gotta have a conversation about this overtime in the nfl because a lot of people keep getting confused on the rules playoffs and regular season overtime are two different things we'll talk about that coming up next i want everybody to know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. place your first five dollar bet and you'll get started with 100 and 50 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed that is 150 bucks in bonus bets bonus bets guaranteed just visit fanduel.com to get started well as i bring my producer to the show sam ekstrom my co-host my friend uh sam it started off a little rocky and uh like any rocky start sam i don't know if you've ever been on a cruise ship i've been on a cruise ship a couple times now um because my i I don't think i would choose to do it anymore but now my kids are older maybe um but we did it one time with a three-year-old and Mm. so when i tell you that it was the worst decision we ever made uh we did the christmas new year's cruise ship thing because my in-laws wanted to do it and you know that's what you do when your family wants to go so you said so it was all the son-in-laws all the grandkids uh and all the daughters my my wife has three sisters and then my mother-in-law her sister went and then her kids went and her grandkids went so you know like a big christmas family holiday deal we spent new year on the ship uh we spent christmas it was christmas day so like you basically get up uh you spend christmas day in a hotel and then you you end up on the ship that that afternoon of christmas and then it's like a holiday cruise and then you end up in the caribbean so it's warm compared to like minnesota so we were in new orleans and then we took off well sam it started off rocky with a three-year-old and i don't know if you've ever done anything like that where you're stuck on a boat with a with a baby the good thing was uh it's my 13 year old now which is crazy if you think about that it was 10 years ago but uh she was a good kid she wasn't like whiny she wasn't she just like but it was sucks because when she would get sick or tired she would get real quiet and it's you know you get nervous when your kids are just like lethargic quiet not doing much now granted you know the next day she was fine you know just a little bit of a cold she got through it because this is it was winter time technically even though we were in new orleans in the caribbean um and that's what i felt like the vikings game started off sam it started off like ah here we go what are we doing zero zero Zero, zero, zero. What, uh, interception. It should have been a touchdown. And then seven, nothing coach. And then it's like, well, 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 he got hit in the face. He getting hit. He, like, yep. Yep. It's coming back. It's coming back. We see the flag. We, um, announcer referee gets on the microphone. Uh, we're going to pick this flag up because that was Sam Darnold and Sam Darnold is not off limits of hitting in the face. So we are going to wave this flag off, uh, touchdown coats, Vikings, you're down seven, nothing Figure it out. And that's, that's what it felt like, Sam. And then, you know, as our crews went on, it got better and better and better. We had a good time. Uh, me and my brother-in-law ended up winning like a three-on-three basketball tournament with some kid we found. He was like a, a high school senior, but he was a basketball player. I'm talking about Sam. This kid was dunking on a cruise ship. You don't see that when you have a 6'3 high school kid that can get up and jump. So we we dominated the, the tourney uh, with my brother-in-law, myself, and this, this young high school kid we had met. Um, and that's what the Vikings end up doing. You know, they end up finding their niche. They end up finding, like Sam Darnold, 
and I, I said this on the Vikings uh, post game show fan line. Uh, and then Kevin O'Connell, I tweeted this morning for the people that you know follow me on Twitter. It's three Ron Johnson, number three Ron Johnson on Twitter. I tweeted the video of Kevin O'Connell saying the exact same thing I said. Sam Darnold theoretically only had four incomplete passes, Sam. Four. So he was cooking. Two, technically six, but two went to the other team. So those weren't dropped. They were caught. So Kevin O'Connell pointed out that same joke that, you know, Sam Darnold only threw four passes that hit the ground. And when you think about that, that's crazy. I mean, granted, that one in the end zone, he probably should have run or maybe throw it out of bounds and live to fight another day, kick a field goal. Maybe maybe Riker still misses. Who knows? Because we wouldn't have known what would have happened. But don't throw the interception. The fumble, nothing we can do about that, but that's the referees. Definitely should have been a, uh, 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 what is it called? Um, excessive force to the head and neck area is what it yeah. is. Uh, it wasn't a face mask, uh, but it was excessive force because the dude was going to miss and then he came across with the for the forearm. That's they're like, oh, maybe they, they waved it because he didn't mean to do it. It doesn't matter if you didn't mean to do it. You you were gonna whiff because Sam Darnold was trying to get out the way and you clotheslined him and you took him down by his head and neck. Like that's that's literally what the rule was made up for to stop guys from doing that stuff. And so when you think about the way it played out, they end up winning the game, Sam. Mm -hmm. And the question of the day for those, you know, watching, listening, YouTube um you know roku whatever you're on you can start commenting now um but let us know are the vikings the best team in the nfc or where do they stand in the nfc sam and my answer to the first part of this no they're not the best team in the nfc i i'm, I'm i think i'm gonna give that i'm giving that to the lions i think i'm gonna give that to the lions i think the lions have earned it uh, when you look at the NFC right now, where the standings are, you got the Commanders at seven and two, and I just think people don't believe in the Commanders. Like when you have the Eagles at six and two and the Commanders at seven and two, until the Commanders have to play the Eagles again, um, or have they played? I don't even know if they played them yet. But until the Commanders like are done and they play the Eagles, nobody's going to give them credit for that just yet. But seven and two Commanders, you got the five and four. So the NFC West seems to be the worst right now. The NFC West, which you wouldn't have thought that with the Rams and the 49ers, Seahawks, and the Cardinals being good, you wouldn't have assumed the worst would have been the NFC West. They are now the old, and this is years ago, if you remember the dumpster fire that was the NFC East. The North is legit. You got four and four as your worst team. Um, and then you got the NFC South, which technically you could say they're the worst, because you got a really good Falcons team, you got an okay Bucks team who took the, the, the Chiefs to the wire, and then you got two pitiful, pitiful teams in the Panthers and the Saints, both at two and seven. And so when I look at that, Sam, where, where I would personally put it, I would say the Lions are one. I got to give the Commanders two, and then I'm going to put the Vikings at three. And that's where I, I do. I'm, and the only reason I'm giving the Commanders their props is because of what they've done. Like they've won in, in, in some good ways. Uh, they've beat the Bears, and so we got to see how the Vikings play against the Bears coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, but I, I put the Vikings right there, and, and maybe they're even with the Commanders. Like, I'm going to say Lions for sure, number one, and then maybe the Vikings and Commanders are all two, and even the Falcons you could put it too. I think they're all kind of even right now because none of them have played each other, but the Vikings are going to play the Falcons. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's a really good case to say the Vikings are two. I think the Lions are squarely number one. Mm -hmm. They are a juggernaut of a football team. And they just acquired former Vikings, Adarius Smith. Yep. If he can stay healthy. Their defensive line. Can he stay healthy? Can he stay healthy? But, you know, the commanders are so new on the scene. It's been so long since they were good. They've got a rookie quarterback. Um, you look at C.J. Stroud last year, right? He was the, the rookie phenom. And they lost in the first round of the playoffs. Or was it the second round? I'll have to check that. Um, but I, I think that once you get into the crunch time of the season, then the commanders and their rookie QB will really be tested. I actually look at Philly winners of four or five in a row. And I know people still have complaints about them, but Saquon Barkley, Devonte Smith, AJ Brown, Jalen hurts, Dallas Goddard, like the weapons over there, when they're fully healthy, they're still dangerous to me. The tush push, you know, um, the, the, the whole offensive vibe, I think is still pretty, pretty strong in Philadelphia. So I, I'm worried about them them coming on strong and peaking late in the year. But I think the Vikings are right there, Ron. I think that, you, like, let's not forget what they did the first five weeks of the season. We've been thrown off the scent a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just uh, the, the bye week, the loss to Detroit, 
the loss to LA, then another half bye week. It feels like they haven't played a lot of football while the rest of the league has played a bunch of football. Um, I think the Vikings are still the number two team in the conference, arguably. Yeah, and, and so when you think about that, like, again, the Vikings have to play the Lions. The way it's and, – and we talked about the schedule. It's favorable the next couple of games. Um, I even thought about this this morning, Sam, because, I mean, I don't know how much you think about football, but it, it, it stays on my brain, especially when I'm, I'm – I got, I got to do the film segment today. Then I got the P.J. Flex show today. Uh, and so I, and I just got the text from the Vikings about Leah and uh, Chelsea – uh, Quasi Adolfo Mensa and then Leo O'Connell. So I'll talk to you about that. So like football is like always on my mind. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I thought about was Mike Tomlin. And here's why I thought about Mike Tomlin. When it comes to going for it, instead of kicking the extra point, Mike Tomlin used to have the 50, 50 rule. Remember he was like, if I can convert 50% of my two point conversions, it's just like making all my field goals. And then if I happen to happen to convert more, then I'm putting the pressure on the other team. With a, with a real Reichert injury to that leg, and you're thinking through what you should do. Now, yeah, you probably want to bring in a guy to kick kickoffs because that's a lot of guys can do that. Field goals, that's a different question. But kickoffs, a lot of guys can come in off the street, kick it to the end zone, uh, and, and get you through the next two or three games. But I feel like this is an offense, Sam. You put them on the two-yard line or three, whatever it is, three-yard line. Justin Jefferson, now you got TJ Hawkinson back. You got Jordan Addison. You got Aaron Jones. You should be able to convert some set, some, some two-point conversions, especially, especially, and again, I'm never going to downplay the opponent, but especially when you look at who you have coming up. When you look at the Jags, when you look at the Titans, when you look at the Bears, like in the Bears, by the way, I don't know what's going on there. Like, I don't know if you saw the video of DJ Moore uh, on the Caleb Williams scramble. I did see that. Just he, just hanging out on the sideline. Just walked yeah, off. He walked off. And so some people, and, and I get the one true part to this. Yes, he stepped out of bounds, so he's now dead. But why, like, and, and then some people are like, well, because if, if DJ Moore, if, if Caleb throws it to him, uh, refs might throw a flag. Refs might not, though. The refs might not even remember. Now, they, they could go back and, like, review that catch if it's a first down. Caleb might throw it to him, so he wants to eliminate. But then maybe just stay on the field, though, like over on that sideline. Just stand there. Even if you're standing out of bounds, just stand there. Don't walk to the bench while the play is still going. That just makes it look worse. Um, so now there's the second week in a row during a play, a player has just quit on the Bears. And so when you look at those three, I'm like, if you're ever going to go for two-point conversions, this is the week's. This is the weeks to do it. This is the weeks where you're probably going to score 30 to 35 points on all three of these teams. So why not make this the week to go for two? These are the weeks that your defense probably is going to feast. Mason Rudolph or Will Levis. I don't care. You're going to eat. That defense is going to eat against the Titans. Trevor Lawrence hasn't really gotten it figured out. Like, he's great. But he, it doesn't feel like he figured it out. And I think it's coach. I feel like if you put Trevor Lawrence with the Vikings, he's a great quarterback. I think Kevin O'Connell would make him a great quarterback. The, the, the infrastructure of the Vikings would make him a great quarterback. The Jaguars don't have that. They don't have the infrastructure, and they don't have the coach and the staff to get Trevor Lawrence to where he needs to be. Like, he's never really gotten over the hump. He gets good, 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 and then it's like, oh, what happened? Good, good, good. What happened? Kevin O'Connell would make Trevor Lawrence great. And then the Bears – Caleb Williams, I feel like like he loves to run around, as you see, and this Vikings defense puts speed on the field. So you're not running away from Ivan Pace the way you ran away from some of these other teams. You're not running away from Josh Metellus or Cam Bynum the way you run from these other teams or Harrison Smith. Like He does not just rush bigs. He's going to rush speed. Dallas Turner, uh, Grenard, Van Ginkle. Way faster than some of these defensive linemen you've been that's been chasing you. You can play video game football and run around and make a highlight. I think he was gonna, I think they're gonna feast on Caleb Williams. And so you look at those three teams where the defense can really dominate, they have a really good run defense as well. Because this was a running team and Jonathan Taylor that everybody was like, Oh, they're gonna run the ball all over the Vikings. And da -da. even me, I even said Jonathan Taylor would have over 100 yards rushing. I, I apologize on the pregame show, I picked Jonathan Taylor to go for over 100 yards. I apologize. The defense is good. They have under 50 yards. So their run defense is better than we gave it credit for. We all said, oh, they're winning by so much. Teams have to throw on them to come back. So that's why they're not running the ball. Colts had the lead. 
coach was 0-0 for most of the game and then took the lead at halftime. It wasn't even a blowout. The coach could have run the ball. They could not do it. They could have tried, and they tried, and it didn't work. So I personally think this defense is good. So if ever, ever a week to not kick field goals and just say, let's go for two, I think this is it. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that one? Because that was the one that just cooked in my mm. brain this morning. I'm like, let's pull some Mike Tomlin out of this with Kevin O'Connell. I don't hate it. Now, sometimes it burns you. So it does. It the, could. It the could. Commanders-Giants game, for instance, the, the Giants decided to go for two late in that game a couple times and missed both. Mm-hmm. And it kind of affected how things played out down the stretch. But um, you, you got to have a kicker available, you right? Do. But, Ron, all, this is an epidemic. All the kickers are hurt. Like, multiple teams have multiple kickers hurt kickers there just aren't any available like all the kickers in free agency have mostly been picked up might be a couple out there but um the vikings might not have a kicker that they trust which lends to your theory that maybe the two-point conversion is the better angle to to take you know put a little pressure on the other team and take a little pressure off of your kicker by getting that extra point early in the game like tomlin likes to do it early right ron like if they score on the opening drive he likes to get that quick eight nothing lead. Yeah, he, he likes can. to put the pressure on the other team, and uh, yeah. he doesn't do it as much anymore. But he still does it every once in a while. Uh, and I'm guessing he has an analytics guy or something that's probably explained it to him because I know for years on the fan line, Corey Cove and I used to go back and forth about that. About like I, I wasn't a fan of going for two, um, but then Corey Cove kind of brought out the like, whoa, two point conversion in the field had been converted at a rate of fifty, you know, percent or more, blah blah. And this was at that time. I don't know what it is now. We'd have to look it up. Um, and then he's like, well, think about it. If you if you get 50% of your two-point conversions, it's just like kicking extra points. So, And then if you happen to happen to have a great week of like great two-point conversions, you're putting a ton of pressure on the other team because every time you score eight, they score seven. And now three touchdowns to their three touchdowns, you're up three. And they have to now, they're still down by a field goal. So I'm like, I get it. I get the thought behind it. I get the metrics behind it. I get the analytics behind it. Um, and so I'm like, again, these three weeks of teams. And again, never overlook your opponent. That's why PJ Fleck always talks about this is the, the championship season coming up for the Rutgers. This is the Rutgers 0-0 zero zero championship season for the Gophers. We're not looking ahead to Penn State because everybody else is. I am. Uh, we're not going to look ahead to the, bo- the bye week because if people didn't know, college football added two bye weeks this year because of the 12-team playoff. Uh, because now it's going to get weird. And so they're like, we got to add some more bye weeks in here for people so we can get more games in and we can get more money and we get more sponsors. I get it. I appreciate it too. I mean, I, I, I but just making the season longer. The season when I played was 12 weeks, 11 games. Now the season is 12 weeks, or sorry, 14 weeks, 12 mm-hmm. games. Uh, and that's a lot. That's a lot for a regular season to have 14 because you have the zero week as well. So some teams didn't play in the zero week. And that's part of these extra buys is so many teams decide to play that zero week early August or late August now that the September starters have to wait and let them catch up to them. So they're like, all right, well, we don't want to play zero week. So let's get our bye week later. Um, I, I don't mind zero week, but I, I would never want to play like a big time team zero week. I would always want if I'm the Gophers, give me uh, Charlotte. <laughs> You know, give me somebody that Indiana played this year. Like, give me any of those teams. Give me, give me Northern Iowa. Uh, you know, University of UNI. Give me the University of Northern Iowa. Give me somebody. Give me a. I don't care. Give me St. Thomas. Like, give me St. Thomas week one zero week. Uh, if I'm the Gophers, but when you and and they're D one now though, right, Sam? St. Thomas. Yeah, FCS, but D one. Mm-hmm. Right, I know, and but like I know they're not FBS, but. Like it would be fun if one year finally they let like St. Thomas get scheduled by the Gophers. I would love to see that. Like well, I would say, love to and St. Thomas is a great program, and that's the type of team that you're nervous about if you're Minnesota. Because <laughs> I assume Minnesota's would pay St. Thomas to come and play oh, at yeah. Huntington Bank Stadium. And and they're I mean, they've they've uh come into D one from D three and they've been like a nine win team every year. So yeah, that'd be, that, that'd be uh dicey to say the least. Yeah, no, but I feel like it's coming at some point, but that'd be a great zero week game in inner city. I mean, inner state, be fun. inner state game, yep. uh, zero week. That means no travel for anybody. Um, that means the, the, all the, like in the Tommy's like, I, I've seen the Tommy Johnny, like they travel. Like they travel well. Like they go to they go to Target Field and, and almost sell it out. Like they they travel well to those type of games. And so I know those those St. Thomas fans would like get up for a gopher game. Like they would try to put, I mean, you might see 30,000 
St. Thomas fans show up to a go to TCF or Huntington Bank Stadium. So, uh, but that's my thought on that. One. But, but uh, I know we got to talk a little bit more about the Gophers. We're probably going to mix some some Vikings in, in there too because we kind of mixed it up this one. Uh, but one thing I did want to talk about quick before we get out of here: uh, Hawkinson's debut, Cam Robinson's trade. Um, what did you think of that? So the Cam Robinson trade, I loved it. I think it worked out. He looked good. Um, again, four, three games now coming up that are, I hate to keep saying easy, but but three games coming up where you don't look at their edge rushers, you're like, oh my God, Cam is going to get killed. Like these next three teams don't have a defense that you're like super worried about. And so, like I said, if we were playing the Lions this week, I'd be a little nervous. If we were playing even the Packers this week or the 49ers defense this week, I'd be a little nervous. But you're playing the Jags, the Titans, and the Bears. And so I want to see Cam Rod. This is going to give him three weeks to really get going before it gets serious again. Uh, and the Bears could be technically considered serious because they're traveling to, to Chicago, and that's always a tough one for them. Um, but what were your thoughts on Hawkinson's debut? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hawkinson's debut, solid. I think only 33 snaps, only going to get better, only going to play more every game. He was on that little bit of a pitch count. Josh Oliver still out snapped him, but we saw that he can be that underneath option on third downs. He can be at the at the chains to be that second read when Sam Darnold needs it. He's the safety valve. And that was really good to see him. Took some hits, got back up, um, made some catches. Good debut. And Cam Robinson, let's just copy paste it. Let's just copy paste that performance throughout the rest of the year. He's only going to get more comfortable in the blocking schemes and assignments. And he's got all the intel on Jacksonville, Ron. He'll be able to to give Minnesota a little bit of info uh, for this weekend's game, too. If the Jaguars have anyone left, I assume they're going <laughs> to trade like three guys today. And, and and all and all jokes aside, I know Florio like he's talking today about like oh the Vikings. Why didn't you trade for 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 Matt uh, Stafford? Um, one I thought about, I'm like, would you trade? What, and I wouldn't because the money's too much. But would you trade for Trevor Lawrence? Over Sam Darnold? Like, I don't think I would. I don't feel like Trevor Lawrence has done enough to prove he's better than Sam Darnold. Not at the cost, certainly. I mean, Trevor Lawrence has been a relative to his expectations, huge disappointment. Um, that deal is five years, two hundred seventy five million dollars, Ron. Yeah, what? That's, crazy. that's so he'd much have to, he'd have to run to redo his deal. Like, do you want to go win a Super Bowl and redo your deal? Let's talk. But he's not signed done. through twenty thirty. 2030 yeah. he is signed through that's crazy that's crazy Whoa. but yeah i agree hawkinson's uh return was great i'm glad that he took a early hit and got up from it uh because that was a little bit like everybody kind of <gasps> and then it was like okay he's fine he got up he walked away and so you know I, I think for him too like that first hit you can even see him look up at the monitor to try to watch it again like oh did i really okay yep i'm good i'm good um also you could tell he kind of learned how to take a hit like that coming across the middle. Like he kind of let his legs, like he lifted up, like he didn't try to fight through the tackle. He just jumped and took the hit and then went down. Like, you know, like some guys would have like stomped in the ground to try to cut. And it's like, you you have, you have no time to cut. If a DB has his B line on you and he's coming for those legs, you don't have time to cut. You just got to jump and let him hit you and then move, live to play another day. Uh, The funniest, and I don't know if you've seen this funny viral video of George Pickens, Uh, People are like, George Pickens is not going to let his legs get rolled up on at all costs. Uh, He's running back towards the play to, like, make a block, and the running back and the DB fall towards him. He Mm -hmm. jumps up in the air, like, at least two feet, three feet high, and then lands on the guy like he's doing a a elbow power bomb. (laughs) And uh, at first, it looks like it should be a flag because that you can see the other players like, what? Like, this is not legal. And then you realize what he did. He saw the guys rolling and he just jumped up in the air and his body naturally just curled up like that. And he fell on top of both guys. Super funny. Um, but it's like one of those things where like, oh, no, I'm not letting you roll up on my legs. I'm saving my legs. I'm, I will land on my back. I will land on my arms. I'm not you're not you're not rolling up on my knees. And so I know with TJ Hawkinson that 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 moment, because it was a similar play coming across the middle, caught the ball, got his leg blown out. Like, I know he had a, a, a kind of like a okay, I'm good. I've been here before. Um, Cause that's a little scary. Like to get hurt, you know, to have a similar play the same way you got hurt the year before. That's a tough one. Uh, but we got to move on to the Gophers because the Gophers have won four in a row. And a lot of people after a certain game had written them off and now the Gophers are back. So we'll talk about that and much more coming up next after a word from our sponsors. 
Today's episode presented by Game Time, the best way to get tickets in your area. We talk a lot about sports on this show. It's also concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Game Time Picks is their curation feature that filters out the fluff and shows you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't waste any time. Uh, there were some awesome deals to get into the Wolves-Hornets game last night at Target Center. Great performance by the Wolves, by the way. You can get tickets, and you got 18 days left until Gophers Penn State at Huntington Bank Stadium. Get those tickets now, maybe before the Rutgers game when prices go up, assuming they win. Uh, toggle on all-in pricing so there's no hidden fees. Get a panoramic view from your seat to the lowest price guarantee, plus the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account. Use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game time. Well, now we have to jump into this Gophers conversation. Four in a row. I mean, so when you go back to this to the early season stuff with the Gophers and you look at you look at their schedule so to start the season off uh didn't go so great you know Max Brosmer's first night out you got to remember too he came from a school that didn't have a ton of like games like this where it was over I mean I don't think he has a game where it was over 20,000 fans and so to walk into a stadium 50 plus thousand fans first opening night night game big cameras lights Fox everybody you know like he hasn't had that before and so might have been trying too much, might have been a little nervous. He said it too. Like he was like, you know, I had to settle in. So they lose North Carolina 19 to 17. Now their kicker also missed field goals. He hadn't missed field goals. Like he was a Big Ten kicker of the year, Sam. Big Ten kicker of the year. And he missed two field goals. He makes one of those, they win the game 20 to 19. He makes two of those, it's 23 19. And it's not even like it's a little bit more breathing room. Sam, they lost two missed field goals. Then they turn around and blow Rhode Island out. They beat uh, Nevada, but then they have that collapse. They are up at halftime, and they fall apart and lose to Iowa. Then Michigan, they spot them with turnover after turnover. I mean, I felt like my tweet, I, I, I tweeted, like, you can't turn the ball over and give Michigan a short field. Boom. You can't turn the ball over, and I just copied, I retweeted it to above my tweet. I'm like, again, you can't, and then, and then again, on the punt. You can't do, like, I'm like, you cannot spot Michigan field position because they're not that good. Their quarterback's not that good. We've seen that. Like, they're not good. And if you spot them field position, you're making it easier on their offense to, like, not have to matriculate down the field 80 yards. They can't do it. They cannot do it. Their quarterback, Alex Orgy, is not good enough. Their other quarterbacks they had come in are not good enough. It's not the same team. They don't have the receivers they had before. They're not good enough. And Minnesota spotted them. And then Minnesota slowly came back, and then the onside kick, and it just wasn't enough. Then, you know, so at that point, Sam, two and three, everybody's down. on them. They're two and three, and it's like, ah, oh, here we go. This is the same old Gophers. You know, they're probably going to lose to a ranked USC team, and they're going to be two and four. Then they'll beat UCLA, maybe. You know, then they'll be three and five. Uh, Maryland, you know, they said, okay, four and five, and then they were like, Illinois would be four and six. Everybody assumed at this point they would have lost six games. And they would only won three, Sam. Or, yeah, Sam, they're six and three. They are. Heading in to play Rutgers. Six and three, heading in to play Rutgers. They can beat Rutgers. We know that. They can beat Wisconsin. So that's eight wins. Number six, Penn State, that's the one. The 23rd, week before Thanksgiving. I think they can pull that off. I think they're good enough with Max Brosmer. I watch Penn State. Penn State is very boring. They're methodical. Um, I feel like the Gophers' defense is is playing faster and faster, and they're getting better and better, and they're going to get more guys back by that, hopefully, if everybody stays healthy. Um, Coy Parrish is on another level. They got Green back. We saw that last week against Illinois. That was huge, having him back. Um, And he's had to kind of take a back seat to Coy Parrish. Uh, But, you know, he's back because I think he had a concussion. I was at the game, and he suffered a concussion, and so he was out. Uh, oh, USC. Yeah, USC game. He suffered a concussion. So, you know, he's back from concussion protocol. And uh, and, and I'm talking about number 14, the safety, there's green. Uh, and when, so when you look at this team, Sam, they can win eight to nine games. Nobody would have thought that early on in the season when they were two and three. And so now that they bounce back, now that you see Max Bros were playing at all time level, now you see Elijah Spencer, you see Daniel Jackson, who's now moved up into the top five gophers of all time receivers wise. 
team looks good, Sam. And so mm -hmm. when you look at down the stretch, Penn State probably being the toughest. They get eighth in Calig Man. Eighth in Calig Manis gets to get his get back this week. This is the eighth in Calig Manis week. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure the Gophers know a lot about him. He knows a lot about the Gophers. Coach Harbo knows, like, I'm pretty sure he's telling Heatherman, like, hey, look, this what this this what Ethan doesn't like. So throw it at him. This is the coverages he can't see. You know, this is what makes him second guess and, and see ghosts. We'll see how much Corey Heatherman listens to Greg Harbo. Um, but Sam, I don't know. What are your thoughts on like the Gophers winning four in a row? And did you see that coming? Really impressed with the job Fleck has done. Sent and I even give credit for the second half against Michigan to bounce back in that game, even though it didn't go their way. That was when the season turned. Yeah. That's where I guess a moral victory can bolster you because they came out of that Michigan game feeling, I think fans felt horrible. They felt like, oh, we spotted them this big lead, came back in the second half, got screwed over by the refs. The season's going to tank after this. And it didn't. That was that. I was a turning point. Mm -hmm. And then the USC win, the UCLA win. And a lot of these games, Ron, props to Max Brosmer for engineering big drives in fourth quarters. He did it again against Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, so now I, I'm looking at a possible nine and three football team. I wish there was a an easier path to make the Big Ten championship because it's probably not realistic. They they're not, they're not going to get in that game. Um, it was easier when you had two, you know, six or seven team divisions, and you could yeah. kind of work your way in that way. Probably not going to happen for the Gophers this year. But if you can get to nine and three and get a really nice bowl game, that would it would be one of the best flex seasons of all time. And at that point, I'm saying to myself, I wish we had Brosner back for one more year. I wish we had two years with this guy so then we could redo the early part of the season with him. Then we could have a chance to, to bank some wins early when mm -hmm. he's more comfortable. Um, and we didn't have that luxury this year, which is maybe why they lost that UNC game, that Iowa game. And here's what's crazy about it. You look at the Big Ten East, how it used to be. Indiana was over there. Um, Ohio State, Penn State were all in the East. In the West, you had Iowa, Minnesota, you had Wisconsin. Minnesota and Iowa right now are tied. Even though Iowa would have the tiebreaker because they beat them, they're both four and two. They're both six and three overall. And so the stretch of the old Big Ten championship way would have come down to Iowa beating UCLA, which probably happens. Iowa beating Maryland probably happens. Iowa beating Nebraska. Now that one, who knows? They play also on Black Friday at 6.30 p.m. And so when you think about that, Nebraska might be, I mean, they're visiting Iowa too. They're going to Kinnick. So, but Nebraska, like they've they've shown every once in a while they can win some games and they can play some like good football. Um, you know, they're they're not they're they're not as good as we thought they were gonna be with, with Riola as their quarterback, but they're also doing better. Then people assume, you know, they lost to Maryland or uh, not Maryland. Sorry. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Um, they, they lost earlier to uh, Indiana, but Indiana now, like at the time when you saw Nebraska lose to Indiana, you're like, ooh. Yeah. But then you're like, wait a minute. This Indiana team is really good. Uh, you also saw Nebraska lose to UCLA, and that's the one that's like a head scratcher. But then they only lost to Ohio State by four. So it's like, which team is Nebraska? So they could beat Iowa. Like, that could be an Iowa loss, which I'm going to be cheering for Nebraska. I'm going to be honest. Like, I, I want to see Iowa lose. Um, also, that puts Minnesota in a better bowl game than Iowa. If Minnesota wins out, if they beat Penn State, that adds to their resume. That'll be the first time in Gophers history. I don't know when the last time they beat three ranked teams, but the last time we beat two was 2000 with me. Um, and now this is the second time they've done it since 2000, or the first time they've done it since 2000, being two ranked teams. Uh, this could be their third ranked win, which, you know, who knows? It might go back to the 70s or 80s or 60s or something since the last time they won three ranked games. Uh, but when you and when you think about that, that would be a huge resume boost. You know, you beat Penn State, you win out, you go nine and three, you get you probably go to a really big bowl, right? Right below some of these power like playoff bowl games. You're gonna be right in a grouping below that. And so that's that's where I look at where the Gophers have a chance. Um, but it, it's just sad to see how big the Big Ten got and they didn't want to do two conferences. Cause even if they do two conferences, like I was looking at that too. And the only issue with doing two conferences um, is that Minnesota would probably end up with Oregon because we would be in the West and Oregon would be in the West. 
And that would be the only issue is like it would be Oregon, Iowa, Minnesota, Washington, um, probably Nebraska, Wisconsin, uh, UCLA, USC. And that would be the West. And then the East would be Purdue, Rutgers, Maryland, uh, Northwestern, Michigan State, Michigan, uh, Illinois, Ohio State in indiana and indiana could flip-flop or you know but i think they would try to keep them over there with that grouping um where minnesota still would be the number two team in the west like they would be the number two team in the west um so yeah i don't know how it's going to play out i don't know how the big 10 is going to do this um but yeah right now as it stands right sam it's going to be the top two teams make it to the big 10 championship mm-hmm. and so yeah. uh, indiana nothing against indiana uh, indiana oregon Big Ten Championship, Sam, seems very, very, very unlike – it's not a, it's not attractive. That's not an attractive Big Ten Championship that I want to tune into. Indiana, Oregon feels very un-Big Ten-ish. Like, it does not seem like Big Ten football to have Indiana, Oregon. Um, and so if I'm the script writers, because right now Indiana has a path that is like unevaded other than this Ohio state game. And that's the one thing that's going to push Ohio state to the big 10 championship is yeah. Indiana plays Michigan this weekend. They get a bye, and then they play Indiana. I'm sorry. I mean, they play Ohio state and then they play Purdue. So they probably lose to Ohio state most likely. Um, and then you have Ohio state, Oregon, Ohio state already lost to Oregon. Oregon plays Maryland. That's a win. Oregon plays Wisconsin. That's a win. And Oregon plays Washington. That's a win. So Oregon is going to go 12 and 0. Then Ohio State would be up there at uh, 10 and 1. And so you're going to have an Ohio State, Oregon. Uh, so two O's in the championship, two O logos in the championship. Um, that feels a little bit better, a little bit better to have Oregon, uh, Ohio State representing the Big Ten championship. Because if Indiana somehow upsets the world, which doesn't throw off the playoff, because Ohio State losing to the eighth team is just going to push Oregon to like or Indiana to like five, probably five or six, and it'll push Ohio State down like right below them. So like they would make like Indiana probably would go to like five or six, and then Oregon would go down to like six or seven. But they would keep them in the top twelve. They know they need Oregon in the top twelve um, because they are the one of the best teams in the country. But a Big Ten championship of Ohio State, Oregon. That's the other thing about the Big Ten championship too, Sam. And I heard somebody talk about this. Ohio State having to play Oregon in the Big Ten Championship, they better hope they're both ranked a little, you know, their rankings don't get screwed up in this. Because if Ohio State somehow upsets Oregon, then you probably leapfrog Georgia goes to one, and then whoever lost goes to three or four, and whoever won goes to two is what I'm thinking. Yeah, they probably all get in. Oh, they the definitely teams. get in because it's 12 yeah. now. It's 12 teams now. If it was four teams, this would be the worst year ever for four teams <clears throat> because there's so many good teams mm-hmm. that everybody would be screaming like are you kidding me like what are we doing because now the way they're doing it is the winners of the power four get in automatically they get the automatic bid doesn't mean they're one through four but they automatically get in and then also the top four teams also get a buy um and so like you could be um trying to think like what is it, the big 12 is one so you could be like BYU. Oh Lord. <laughs> but you could be BYU and win the Big 12 and you're in. Um and, and I think that's what people are looking at is like, okay, where does BYU fall though in the overall rankings of football? Like, I don't know. I have not watched enough BYU football, but when you look at who they've played, it's not a lot of like big time games on their roster on their list. Like they have Houston coming up, they're ranked ninth, they have Houston coming up in Kansas. So if they win the Big 12, they're in, but people are going to be like, well, but they're not a top four team and they won the Big 12. So what does that say about the Big 12? And that's where it gets even weirder. You know, like Texas and everybody leaving, going to the SEC now. It's just weird. It's weird. It doesn't feel right to me, but I'm learning as I go. Um, But we got to jump into this uh, daily three. That's three questions. It's been about a minute each today. So we'll be back after a quick pause. This show is brought to you by FanDuel, and when you have a hunch, you can take advantage at FanDuel. Right now, new customers, when you place a $5 bet, you get $150 in bonus bets if that $5 bet wins. Uh, It might be the live line during the game, might be before the game, might be a futures bet. 
uh, that you wager. But if it wins, you cash 150 in bonus bets. You can spread that around on college football, like we're talking about. NFL, Vikings are four and a half point favorites against Jacksonville. NBA, NHL, college basketball is now getting started. Every wagering option available to you at FanDuel.com. America's number one sportsbook for a reason. Very cool FanDuel sportsbook app. Get started at FanDuel.com. Bet five, earn 150 at FanDuel. Well, now it's time for the Daily Three. That's three questions, about a minute and a half each. Take it away, Sam. All right. I, I'm calling an audible. Omaha. Okay. We're we're going to replace this Wolves question because I, I wrote this before the Monday night game. I want to hear your take on Bucks chiefs Couple couple different factors here. So the Bucks choose not to go for two, and this ties into our two-point conversation. Mm-hmm. Todd Bowles ties the game, or comes within a point on a touchdown late, has a chance to go for two in the waning seconds and win in rainy Kansas City mm-hmm. and not give Mahomes a chance in overtime. He goes for one. Mahomes wins the toss, goes down the field, ends the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so two question, two part question: What do you think of Bowles' decision, and what do you think of the overtime rule where only one team can get the ball? Uh, so again, we talked about this in the open. Uh, regular season versus playoffs, it changes. Playoffs, you give both teams a chance to get the ball because everybody's like. Hey, it's not fair that uh, what was it? Josh Allen for years kept getting Patrick Mahomes, um, as you would call it. Like it's it's now the Patrick Mahomes rule. Like Patrick Mahomes ended so many people's playoffs by going down and scoring in overtime that the NFL said, okay, we got to figure out a way to change this because this is not fair to Patrick or to the other teams because they have to deal with Patrick Mahomes. Uh, Patrick Mahomes did it again. Now regular season, I still don't care. Like. I don't want to be up all night watching the game, going back and forth and giving them both a chance. I do understand it. Like Patrick Mahomes scores. So now that now puts the pressure on um, uh, the other team. They have to come down. Todd Bowles has to come down and Baker Mayfield has to score in the rain. Uh, Do they score? I don't know. They were moving the ball pretty well at the end of that game. So maybe, but do we really want to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth? Because that that's the rule would be, because after both teams score, is it the next score wins? Is that how it goes? Or is it just if you play the quarter? Because in the playoffs, you just play the quarter out, right? You could just keep scoring. Uh, playoffs, after the first exchange, I think it's next score wins. So if two teams score a touchdown, next score wins. And that's why some people go for two because they want to put the pressure on the other team. So, yeah, I would have probably went for two. I personally, like if you're on the road, I think people always say if you're on the road and you have a chance to steal one from the home team, you go for two and you don't give them a chance. Like you take that out of their hands. You lose, you lose the game. We're either going to win the game. Or we're going to lose the game, but we're not going to let it get to overtime. And the way they have matriculated down the field from the three yard line, I think the bucks would have won. I do. I think that defense was tired. They had been like chasing uh, or uh, Baker Mayfield up and down the field. Uh, they could not stop the run. They could not stop the pass. They could not make tackles because the guys were slipping on the ground. Um, I would have, I personally, I would have went for two. If I'm Ty Bowles, I'm going for the win. Me too. Me too. I think right, we, he, uh, he has to. Yeah. It's Mahomes. It's in Kansas City. If the Bucks had won that game, Ron, they would have hung the only loss on the Chiefs this year and the Lions, both on the road. Yeah. Crazy. Proving they're a really good team, but their record is, well, is not going to show it. That's the thing that sucks about the NFL. Like, it comes out to a game in inches, and nobody's going to go back and look at those records and be like, oh, but remember, like, remember how they beat the Lions? And, like, nobody's going to care. Nobody cares. Uh, what you got next? Yeah. NFL trade deadline today. In the next few hours, Ron, is there a position hmm. that you would like to strengthen for the Minnesota Vikings? Yeah, cornerback. I think they do need another cornerback personally. Like uh, people keep saying interior defense alignment and I get it. Cause they're not getting Aaron Donald type like push on the, uh, on the passes, but I think he's getting enough pressure from the outside. He's getting enough pressure from creating it with different guys. Um, they are stopping the run. So I don't think like analytics tells me like, yeah, visually you think you need an interior defense lineman, but statistically it doesn't show. Like I, I get you, you should want to get home with four and not have to always blitz, but that's what this is what his team is built for. He's built to blitz. So I would want to go with cornerback because it feels like um they could use another young, healthy body in there. Yeah, I'm gonna steal a take from Luke Braun because remember, Ron, all the cornerbacks are free agents after this year. Mm-hmm. Shaq, Murphy, Gilmore. 
Luke Braun mentioned Greg Newsom. Yeah. And that's a guy with a couple of years of team control, former first round pick from Cleveland. Cleveland's yep. probably, and they're already selling. They already sold Zadarius Smith. But if you can get someone that is also on your team next year, like they mm-hmm. did with Haw- the Hawkinson trade, right? That would be a cool deal to start building up next year's cornerback group. So actually, I'm, I'm with Luke Braun on that one. Um, and I agree with you. Cornerback is a need. So, yeah, and that's, that, that's why I said, like when you guys asked me that a, while, a long time ago, I said Greg Newsom. The two names were Greg Newsom and uh, Joseph from the Patri- uh, Patriots. Like those are two cornerbacks that are on the trade block that I would go after. I said that on the Vikings fan line uh, weeks ago after Gilmore got beat a couple of times. I was like, I would I would go after a cornerback. It was like right when trade was coming up. I was like, Greg New- uh, Newsom was the name because he's young. Now he hasn't played up to his draft status. Uh, but he's still young. And I think, again, I think situation matters. You put him with Brian Flores, I think that matters. And clearly Cleveland, getting rid of Zadarius, they're they're willing to move some pieces because they're kind of in that mode of Deshaun Watson now. And I think I think they feel like, you know what? Let's get up out of this. Let's 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 unload some of these contracts. Let's move on. Let's get some some draft capital. The problem with the Vikings, though, is they don't have any. Like they would have to trade like a 2027 you know, pick like they don't really have (laughs) any capital. But the good thing about trading for a first round pick that hasn't panned out, you don't have to give up a first or second or third round. Even I think you can get Newsom for like a fourth or fifth rounder in like 2027. So who cares about leveraging your future? You can find ways to get those back, but you can't get first round corner that you think might work with Brian Flores. I also like Calais Campbell. If Campbell was available for the right price, Um, veteran cheap and uh, productive this year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would like that a lot. Uh, last one. You you've spoken that you don't you're not the biggest fan of Jaguars coach Doug Peterson. Well, I'm wondering if the Vikings get a blowout win on Sunday, mm-hmm. is Doug Peterson fired in Jacksonville? Are they going to get a second coach fired this year? Well, the Raiders just fired their offensive coordinator, so people are always looking for scapegoats. So I think if it's a bad blowout, I'd say yes. Like if it's bad and the team quits, I'd say yes. If it's just a win. I'd say no, because clearly I think the Jags, they don't know what the problem is. And I don't know if they think coach is the answer, but I don't think they even know what the problem is. And that's the problem. Um, I'm more frustrated. I have nothing against Doug Peterson. I'm just frustrated how some of these coaches continue to get chance after chance after chance, and they prove they can't win. So, like, start looking at the college rankings. Start looking at these assistants who haven't had an opportunity to be a head coach. Stop, like, recycling coaches. I'm so sick of that. Like, uh, the guy from the uh, Getze, Luke Getze, leaves the Bears. Terrible offensive coordinator with the Bears. And then he gets hired to be the Raiders offensive coordinator. Like, he didn't do anything. So why would you hire, you know, that's like hiring a chef that can't cook. Like, oh, he got fired from Chili's because he can't cook. So I'm going to just go ahead and bring him over here to Ruby Tuesdays and see if it works here. It's not going to – he can't cook. So stop doing that. I like, guess so frustrating to me that they keep hiring coaches that fail and then you get another chance at the same position. I, I'm fine with working your way back up. Like, if you're a chef – Go be a server for a little bit and work your way back up to, to, to head chef. But you don't just get to go be a chef again, and you're terrible for the team. Um, that, to me, is very strange. And then the Raiders, within, what, nine? What is this, week seven or week nine or ten? They got rid of the offensive coordinator, So, uh, which is clearly like the, the head coach. You know, Pierce is trying to, like, save himself. Like, all right, look, all right, I'm not going to get fired because you, you're terrible. Devontae Adams hated you. The team hated you. So let's get rid of you, too. Um, so I, I, I'm just sick of that. But, no, Peterson – yeah, I just don't think he's a good fit for Jacksonville. Um, I, again, I think they need to go young. You got a young quarterback. You need to get a young coach. You need to get a Kevin O'Connell. You need to get somebody that can identify and talk to these young guys. I mean, and honestly, I think Josh McCown is on the short list now. Like Josh McCown, the way he's learning under Kevin O'Connell, he's going to be on the short list. To be. He already had an interview as a non-NFL coach. Now, after two or three years of being an NFL coach, I think he's going to be on the short list for a team like Jacksonville. I wonder, too, if teams would fire a coach early and then start planting the seeds with Belichick. Like, Mm. if they get ahead of the game and get Belichick in there, like, would that be the incentive to make an early move and then try to secure Bill? Maybe. I just think the league's passing by, though. I think his style of coaching and his – yeah, it's like he's he's old. Just let him be old. Let him be old. You think he's going to go on? for the rest of his career i feel i feel like that's just the he's stepping made up. a ton of freaking money and he's 72 like just be a be an old guy and be on tv just let it go because coaching does not help your health like and he's not going to find another tom Brady. i mean unless he goes to a situation with a quarterback like he's not clearly we know he can't do it with a guy like mac jones like he can't 
So he needs a Tom Brady. Like it took him a while to build what he built with Tom Brady. Um, but he needs a Tom Brady. And if he doesn't get to go to a team that has a, a infrastructure for quarterback, what's the point? Um, but yeah, but I'm looking forward to this week. We got we got the Vikings on the road in Jacksonville, Gophers in the road in Piscataway, uh, New Jersey, and Rutgers. Um, so it's gonna feel like a groundhog's day, maybe out there for them. But I hope the groundhog's day means win number five. We're going to do this all over again. They're going to wake up, they're going to win, and they're going to wash and repeat. I'm Ron Johnson. I said, I'm actually want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, guys. Those that are on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Uh, Amazon Fire and Roku, we appreciate the download. And then listening on your podcast, where, wherever you get your podcast, tell a friend to tell a friend that we're here. It's going to be a long season, and we're having fun doing it. Uh, I want to thank you guys. Have a great week.